In this tutorial, we'll look at the life cycle of stars. The first aim is state the main stages of a small and big star's life cycle, then describe the energy changes involved in the formation of a star, and then finally explain how changes in pressure and gravity affect a star. Now, we've already explored some pretty mind-blowing ideas when it comes to stars. We've explored the idea that stars are element factories that produce all the matter that exists in our universe and also responsible for scattering it across the universe. This matter is then free to react to form all the living and non-living components of our universe. We've also looked at the incredibly thought-provoking notion that when we look at stars we are looking into history. In fact, many of the stars we gaze upon at night time may not actually be there anymore. They may have died a long, long time ago. So in effect, we're looking at a sky full of ghosts. And then, of course, there's the extremely appealing idea of the black hole, a point of singularity in space that consumes and devours all matter around it. Where it goes through the black hole, we just don't know. We can even entertain the idea that a black hole is a portal at another point in space-time, so in effect, travelling through a black hole is a form of time travel. So the aim of this tutorial is quite simply to unravel some of the mystery that we associate with stars. So the best place to start when looking at stars is to examine the nucleus of an atom, that simple building block from which all other matter is made. Inside the nucleus you'll find two types of particles, protons, which are positively charged, and neutrons, which have no charge. Because of this, nuclei have an overall positive charge. Now, just like with magnets, if you put two alike poles together, they repel, and nuclei will also want to repel due to their alike charges. What stars do is smash atomic nuclei together so hard and so fast that they combine or fuse together. This process is called nuclear fusion, and when such nuclear reactions occur, tremendous amounts of heat and light are released. So much so that we can detect and feel the intense heat and light over 150 million kilometers away from the nuclear reactions that are occurring in our sun. So here's a quick recap of some of the nuclear reactions that occur in a star to transform the simplest of lightest of elements into heavier, more complex ones. You see, stars, like our sun, are element factories. The intense heat and pressure within a star is enough to forge new, more complex elements from simple ones. This process of smashing elements together, or atoms together, to make complex ones is known as nuclear fusion. And it works a little bit like this. Hydrogen is the simplest element in our universe. It's the smallest atom. And stars will smash hydrogen atoms together to make more complex elements such as helium. And when the hydrogen fuel has run out, stars will smash helium together to make larger, more complex elements. So now you can see from helium we've made beryllium, a metal. And this process keeps on going to make more complex elements. So now we've made carbon. And this process continues to make other elements such as nitrogen and oxygen, and finally iron, which is incredibly heavy and will indicate the end of a star's life cycle. So some large stars will explode in huge explosions called supernovas. And when they do this, they scatter the elements they've made across the universe. So let's look at an overview of the basic stages of a small and big star's life cycle. Most of what you get tested on an exam, you can learn from this section alone. So it's really important to know that different sized stars have different fates. In other words, they have different stages to their life cycle. However, they start off much the same. All stars, no matter whether you're small or big, start their lives off in large clouds of hydrogen gas and dust called nebulae, or nebula for one. You can think of nebulae as star nurseries, where stars are born. Once nuclear fusion has occurred, you get a protostar, which will then evolve into a main sequence star. Our sun, which by the way is a small star or medium small star, is currently in its main sequence star stage. This stage makes the bulk of a star's life cycle, and it's definitely the most stable stage of a star's life cycle. After this stage, stars will expand to become red giants. When our sun hits this stage, it will expand to a diameter of about two astronomical units. That's about 300 million kilometers in diameter. That's double the distance we are currently from our sun. Now we'll focus on just small stars first. Towards the end of a small star's life cycle during the red giant phase, the outer layers shed away. 
This forms a structure known as a planetary nebula because you're left with this cloud of dust and gas. The core of the star will become a white dwarf, a bit like the glowing ember of a fire before it dies out. And once the fuel's gone, we're left with basically a carbon carcass called a black dwarf. Big stars have a different fate beyond the red giant stage. Your average big star will be involved in a huge explosion called a supernova. Once again after this stage you'll be left with the core of a star. But this star is much denser, much heavier and smaller and we call it a neutron star. If however you are a massive star, once again you'll have the supernova stage but this time you'll form a black hole. So just to recap, small stars start off their life just like big stars as nebulae. Then they form the main sequence star stage from a protostar and then a red giant. Only small stars will then form planetary nebulae, form a white dwarf and then a black dwarf. Big stars will basically undergo a supernova explosion, then form a neutron star and massive stars, supernova, then a black hole. In exam, this could be just a tick box, multiple choice question, just to identify key stages. Or it could be a six marker, describe the main stages of a small star's life cycle or a big star's life cycle. And you literally just state the stages. It's as easy as that. This requires no significant amount of intelligence, just a fairly good memory. So that is how you state the main stages of a small and big star's life cycle. So now let's examine how a cloud of dust becomes a star and specifically we'll focus on the energy changes involved because this is what you get tested on largely. So in this example we've got a nebula and we've got these particles representing let's say hydrogen nuclei because if you remember a nebula is hydrogen gas and dust. Now although gravity is a very weak force it's enough to cause the gas and dust to slowly collapse together. So effectively the energy changes, the gravitational potential energy stored in these particles is transferred to kinetic energy as they start to move closer together, brought together by the force of gravity. These particles aren't moving fast or hard enough for fusion to occur yet, but they are being brought closer together. As they collide, just like when you slap your hands together, that kinetic energy is transferred to thermal energy, heat energy. The particles now have more energy to so start moving together faster. And this process repeats until particles collide fast enough for nuclear fusion to occur. At this point, a star is born, or at least a protostar, which will then evolve into a main sequence star. So just a quick recap, gravity causes gas and dust to collapse together. The gravitational potential energy is transferred to kinetic energy as these particles start to move towards each other. When they collide, the kinetic energy is transferred to thermal energy. Because these particles are now hotter, they have more energy to move faster, and this process goes on and on until the particles collide with enough force for nuclear fusion to occur. At this point, a star is born, and it will start outputting the quantities of light and heat we normally associate with stars. And that is how you describe the energy changes involved in the formation of a star. But to truly understand why stars behave the way they do, we have to understand the forces involved in a star life cycle. There are only two forces you need to consider. Pressure, which plays off against gravity. Pressure is created by heat, causing the particles in the core of a star to push outwards. And because the particles have a mass, and mass has gravity, basically gravity is constantly trying to collapse the star, basically acting inwards. So you can see the two forces here. We've got pressure acting outwards and gravity acting inwards. So in many respects, it's a bit like a tug of war between gravity and pressure. So in the most stable stage of a star's life cycle, in other words, the main sequence star stage, pressure and gravity are balanced. This is why it's such a stable stage. Now from this point onwards, only watch if you're really interested in learning about stars. It's not so important for your exams. The red giant stage occurs when the hydrogen fuel in the core of a star is used up. As you saw earlier, hydrogen collides with other hydrogen atoms and fuses to form helium. Now helium is a heavier element which requires more energy before fusion happens. As a result, the pressure drops because the temperatures drop, so gravity starts to win. And because of that, the star starts to contract. 
As the core of the star contracts, the internal pressure of the star increases as helium atoms start to fuse. This generates more heat in the core, and this heat ignites the hydrogen fuel in the outer layers of the star. As a result, the pressure in the outer layers of the star increase and it starts to expand. So a red giant stage is when the expansion of the outer layers causes the star to just get bigger and bigger. As the outer layers expand in the red giant phase, they distance themselves so far away from the core that the force of gravity has very little hold on them, so they start to drift off into space. This is what forms the planetary nebula. Meanwhile, in the core of the star, fusion has still been occurring to form heavier and heavier elements. As a result, the force of gravity increases and the star starts to contract and it keeps on contracting until the electrons that make up the atoms that make up the star are brought so close together that they start to repel each other. At this point, the force of gravity cannot overcome the repulsive force of these electrons being close to each other, so the star stops contracting. The resulting feature is called a white dwarf. But this is only the fate of small stars. What about big ones? So big stars, because of their larger core and therefore larger mass in the core, after the supernova explosion, contraction starts to happen. In other words, gravity is beating pressure. So gravity pulls the star inwards, and it does so more so than a small star. But again, it's stopped by something. You see, this time the force of gravity is so large that it can overcome the repulsion force that is created when electrons are near each other. So the star continues to contract beyond this point. In fact, it contracts so much that the electrons basically combine with protons in the nucleus of an atom. And when the electrons and protons combine, in other words, the negative electrons and positive protons combine, you form a neutron with no charge. So you end up with this dense core full of neutrons, and that's why it's called a neutron star. But if the star is truly massive, then nothing stops the force of gravity. It completely wins off the scale. At this point, the force of contraction is so great that electrons can't stop it, protons can't stop it, neutrons forget about it. If you think about it like this, if space is just a two-dimensional sheet, or let's say like a skin of a trampoline, well, the contraction of a huge star's core will form a point of singularity on this sheet, which is so dense, so incredibly dense, that it causes the fabric of space to dip inwards. This is what we call a black hole. And it's so incredibly dense, then, you know, it's assumed that matter can't escape, but so dense that even light can't escape. That's why it's called a black hole, because it emits no light. Even light flows into a black hole. And that's about as much detail as I'll go into in this specific tutorial. So that is how you explain how changes in pressure and gravity affect a star.